Uh, first of all, I'll uh, please allow me to thank the organizers as well for the invitation. It's a great honor and, and privilege to be here. Uh, very interesting uh, intervention so far, um, and um, I think it's uh, it's been a great day so far. Um, I hope to add to it. Maybe I should just add a little bit to my background uh, in regards to what uh, Nora already uh, mentioned. Um, I uh, initially started my career uh, years ago, about 10 years ago, as a, as a um, civil servant at the Danish DPA, uh, where I also sat as an alternate for two years on the Article 29 Working Party. Uh, I was then subsequently, uh, a few years later, I was the, the chair uh, back in 2012 of the, the DAPEX Working Party, which is negotiating the... Uh, the new draft uh, data protection regulation, as you may know, uh, which is sort of the, the context that, that I'll be speaking out from now. And I have also actually uh, written, uh, co-authored an article that was published here by, by, by Cambridge uh, in the uh, yearbook on European legal studies, which uh, bears, which, which touches upon the, the, the proposed um, regulation. And it has the, the title of the illusion of harmonization, just so you know where, where I'm coming from in regards to the, uh, to the regulation. Um, but um, as, as, as the privilege of being the last speaker in a, in a long day, of course, I'll, I'll try to keep it short and, and, and to the point. Um, and um, let's get into it. Just quickly, I thought it might make sense to just update a little bit on, on uh, the general data protection regulation and what has been going on and, and, and why is this taking so long? I think uh, uh, one of the things that, that is often missed in the debate on, on the regulation moving forward is that uh, there, there are many reasons why this is taking a lot, a lot of time. You could argue initially, is it even delayed because uh, there is no uh, set time limit, of course. That, that's often the, the, um, what, what's been said, is that in some ways the, the council is delaying, it, it's, it's postponing, it's not living up to some deadline, but there is no deadline. Um, what, what actually uh, is important to remember is that um, it took a long time to uh, pass the previous directive or the current directive. That actually took five years to negotiate. That was in, from 1990 to 1995, and we only had 12 member states. Now we have uh, 28 member states and a European Parliament that also wants to play a big role. Um, but even more important, and just to, just to illustrate that, um, there are a lot of interests at stake. I think everyone in, in this room is uh, aware of that, but, but just to give an example, back in, in October of, of 2013, um, the, the, uh, the European Council was supposed to discuss the data protection regulation. Uh, you may not notice, but for those of you who are not completely engaged in how council works, at the bottom you have the DAPEX expert working party. On top of that, you have the core pair, which is the sort of the ambassadors uh, to the EU of all the member states. Uh, then you have the council of ministers for whatever sector you're in. So in this case, it's the justice and home affairs ministers. And on top of that, you had, of course, the, the, the heads of state or the heads of government uh, in, in what's called European Council. And uh, they've only discussed the data protection regulation once. And that was in October of 2013. And what's interesting there is that um, on the very same day as Angela Merkel was, was going to go to Brussels to, uh, to discuss this regulation, this exact proposal, um, the very same day, the revelation on, uh, from Snowden came out about her phone being tapped. Now, you could believe that that was a coincidence, that that, that didn't that happen you know, it could have happened two months later or two months earlier, who knows. But it happened on the very same day. Now, I don't believe in coincidences of that kind. So I take that as a very illustrative example of how many and how big interests are in, at stake in this one proposal. And uh, they are commercial and they are political and they are technological and societal and a lot of other things. And I think the discussion today has, has demonstrated that. But I think it's important to keep that in mind when you're discussing whether or not this is moving too slowly and, and uh, why it is, is taking so long, and what, is, what are they actually discussing? Um, well, what's happening right now, I think it's fair to say that, that there is, uh, there's been a, a process in council which is uh, taking some time. Um, I think they're also running out of time, because I think there is a political incentive to get this done, uh, at least in council, within the year. So I think that uh, the, the, the latest development was that a few weeks ago, uh, they agreed a what's called a parcel general approach on the one-stop shop. Uh, I stayed here, it, it was somewhat strained in the sense that it's not completely closed and there's a probably a revision clause being put in so we can open this whole discussion up in maybe 10 years' time and have fun again. Uh, and uh, and um, it was also agreed under the caveat that nothing is agreed until everything is agreed. So they're not completely agreed on this, but still it's moving forward. And I think that there are uh, strong signs that they will close up uh, the council part of this in, uh, in June, 
and which means that uh, straight after that, the so-called trilogue will begin, which means that the process shifts fundamentally. So you go from having a, a large room with a lot of experts and a lot of leaks uh, and a lot of different agendas into a very small room with only three stakeholders in the room, uh, being the council uh, rotating presidency, the European Parliament rapporteur, and the co commission's uh, civil servants negotiating this proposal. So that's going to, I think, that's going to energize the process in, in many ways, and I think it will solve some of the issues that have been that have been, been created, uh, especially in council. I have to say, uh, council's process has, in some ways, uh, broken down. Uh, I don't think what's what's happening right now is constructive on on the one stop shop, and that is going to that is going to need some fixing at some point. But um, uh, Mr. Smith already uh, touched upon that earlier. The final time frame, I, I put a question mark there because no one knows, no one can actually predict when this will happen. Uh, some are saying that that uh, if they start in June, they could do the trilogue by the end of the year. I find that fairly optimistic. That would be one of the faster trilogues I have ever experienced. Uh, uh, it, it, and given how big the proposal is and the stakes uh, are high, I think that that might be a bit positive. Uh, but. Um, but maybe uh, maybe early to 2016 would not uh, be completely out of the out of the question. I think so. That's that's probably the most likely scenario in my opinion. But no one really knows. Um, but moving forward to the sort of more specific point that that I was uh, asked to touch upon today, I tried. I, I thought that the best way to do it was basically to show what has been on the table so far regarding uh, jurisdiction or or applicable law, and it's it's all in the same article. And actually, it's one of the few articles that all different uh, actors, all the three actors, including council, have actually agreed some kind of common position on. So in regards to territorial scope, now what I've tried to do here is what is uh, the, the italics uh, text shows what, what, what is basically similar to the existing wording. So that's not new wording in regards to territorial application. Uh, the underlined is in this uh, commission, this is the commission proposal from 2012, are now new uh, suggested added wording. So an interesting point here is that they just put in, uh, which is a more fundamental point, the fact that now the processor is now mentioned specifically as as a an, uh, as a, someone who's obligated directly by the regulation when when processing data within the union. Now, in the second um, instance of this uh, of the original proposal from the commission, uh, you can see that they add on some new some new wording. Uh, and what's actually the interesting bit here is that. Um, they focus on either the offering of goods or services to data su subjects in the union or the monitoring of their behavior. Now, the interesting thing here is that this regards, as you can see in the first sentence, data subjects residing in the union. And the processing is being carried out by a controller not established in the union. Now, during the, uh, the negotiations in council, one of the first questions we had is we did the first round of, of, of comments on this, this proposal was, Okay, so let's say that a European citizen who resides in the Union goes to New York and is caught by a video surveillance camera by, an by a controller who's not established in the Union. That would trigger this entire regulation then. Secondly, obviously, you can ask the question, what is monitoring in any case? I think the original idea from, from the Commission, although they were not very willing to, to divulge precisely what they meant by monitoring, is in regards to online tracking. Uh, it could be any kind of tracking technology, uh, cookies, uh, whatever. Obviously, that's an important issue. You want to address that. But of course, you need to make sure what this means. And this goes to the heart of why it's taking a long time in council, because there are many issues like this throughout the regulation. And uh, it's going to be difficult to, to, um, to sort of uh, to define this. Uh, and it's going to be one of the many issues that are going to be left to the DBAs to figure out, I think. Um, Moving forward, the the, uh, the final part is is also actually uh, a pretty basic, already well known text from the from the current directive. Doesn't really add that much. Moving to what the Parliament then suggested, they added uh, an an extra sentence to the to the first uh, uh, section of the of the article, saying that uh, regard whether or not processing takes place in the union. So uh, this would this would mean apparently that, for instance, a, a a processor uh, who decides to, or a controller who decides to put uh, data somewhere else, uh, will also, for that, uh, in regards to that data, be specifically caught by the regulation. That makes that makes sense in in, in a certain way. Um, now they've also added uh, the bold here is additional wording from the from from, from Parliament. What they thought 
is, um, is important to add uh, to there. And they've added um, or processor. So again, a processor is now specifically targeted out as, and made a, a objective to, uh, to regulate by the, by the law. Uh, obviously, that also adds new questions and layers of complexity to what will this actually mean for someone like Google. Um, I'll come to that at the end, but uh, also an important uh, issue is, is whether or not um, a commercial transaction takes place. But again, they're keeping the, the idea of monitoring data subjects in the text. And actually, Council is doing something very similar, because um, here's their proposal, and they have just but they have added in order to uh, address uh, the issue that, that I mentioned earlier about the video surveillance going on in New York uh, to, uh, to narrow the provision to only uh, take into account behavior that, uh, tracking that, uh, monitoring, sorry, that is covering behavior that takes place within the European Union. So this will still presumably call, catch a, a tracking cookie being placed on or following someone within uh, the European Union, but not if you're exposed to some kind of surveillance while you're on holiday uh, on the Maldives. So that makes sense in a sense. Um, and again, again, maintaining the, the traditional sort of uh, public international law um, uh, jurisdictional rule. So what will this all lead to? Well, at the end of the day, I think this, it's, it's fairly certain that there will be a, a I only write here some degree, but probably a large degree of extraterritoriality. I think that's 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 plain to see. Um, um, all three uh, co-legislators, all the three uh, institutions, agree that the rules should apply uh, in third countries. Now, this raises a number of questions, of course. Uh, first of all, is what is monitoring? As I already mentioned, which is a, a separate issue. You you can you can argue that for a long time, I think, and. Uh, and again, the DPAs will have uh, have a lot of, of work cut out for them trying to figure out whether or not this rule has been has been triggered or not. And if it has, how do they enforce those rules? Um, coming from from the Ministry of Justice, uh, being a lawyer who cares about how you draft rules, I have to say that that making rules is one thing, but you always want to make rules that you can actually enforce in reality, uh, for many reasons. Just as I am not a big fan of the idea of the title of the right to be forgotten because I think it creates false expectations. I think the same is the case if you are setting up rules that you uh, claim apply to what is going on in a third country and not providing tools or realistic options for the authorities to actually enforce those rules. So I think that's going to be a central issue that is probably not going to be solved by the legislator but more by, by the facts on the ground. So I think it will create unrealistic uh, expectations. And you can also ask, what will a third country think about the EU extending its competence in this way? Some will argue, well, the US is already doing this. But well, the world is bigger than just the US. And, and I think we, the EU needs to, to, to consider carefully whether or not it, it, is a, it is a suitable way to go to uh, impose their rules on, on what's going on in third countries. But I'm afraid that then no one's going to be listening to me in this regard, and I think it's definitely going to happen uh, no matter what I say here today. And what does this mean in regard to Google Spain president? Well, given the fact that, that the court has said pretty clearly that they consider Google to be a data controller, I don't think uh, that there can be much doubt then that, that th these rules will obviously be triggered in regards to almost anything that, that someone like Google or any other search engine uh, will be doing, because they will either be a data controller or a data processor, uh, most likely a data data controller given the, the precedent. Obviously, uh, as long as you're using the same terms as has been laid out by the court in, in the verdict, there's no reason to assume that the law would be any different. Um, so going forward, I think this is still going to be an issue. Um, the, reason, the, the place to solve it would be in the definition uh, and the elaboration on the right to be forgotten uh, in the actual regulation, and that is uh, is yet to be closed. So. That was, um, that's all I wanted to say. I just Let, let me just uh, finally just leave with uh, maybe one observation I made listening to some of the, the earlier uh, interventions during the day. Is that I think, or I, I often think when I hear the discussions about this verdict, that, that there's what you might call a degree of, of cognitive dis dissonance. There's, there's on the one hand the argument that it is absolutely crucial that data be removed from, from search engines, from Google. I think the, the wording was what was being said that that in the, in the actual uh, Castella case, the, the problem was Google. It was not the Gazette. It was not the initial publication. That was the issue. The, it was Google that we were, it was crucial that we that we went to and had the data removed because that's where they found the data. 
But then on the other hand, sometimes even the same people in the next sentence can pivot and say, well, when it comes to the discussion of freedom of speech and, and possibly censorship or whatever you would call it, well, Google's not really that important. I mean, that's not where we find our information necessarily. You know, it's only part of our information. It, it surely has to be has to be important in both regards. So I think it's important to recognize that fact and also recognize that the, the basic tension is that on the one hand you have a societal value, which is freedom of speech, and then you have a very more, I mean, perhaps more personal value. So in the in instance, in, in each specific instance, there will always be a tendency to lean towards recognizing the individual's right to have something deleted. And no one is really advocating the sort of societal side of that. Uh, issue, and I think that's that's a big tension right now in in the debate, and that's a big issue. On and where that's going to end up is going to be be very interesting to see going forward. I don't have the answer. 